It's the first bill that he puts out. That's all it says. You know, basically we accept the Constitution that California has proposed, which is, you know, that they enter the Union as a free state. The second element of the compromise says that New Mexico and Utah, which are both territories, both territories out of that large uh, session of land that the United States had gotten from Mexico at the end of the Mexican War, those two territories will have a vote. We'll get to the voters in those two territories. We'll get to decide whether or not the state has slavery or not. Douglas refers to this as the concept of popular sovereignty. The people are in charge, basically, is what popular sovereignty means. And so New Mexico and Utah territories, popular sovereignty will decide whether or not they get to have slavery in those two states. Now, those two states are in the south. They're, they're for the most part, south of the Missouri Compromise Line, uh, with the exception of Utah, um, and all of it, most of it is. Um, and so, you know, the idea that they, you know, would more than likely probably have slavery because people tended to to emigrate to the west in sort of a straight line. And so, people who had had slavery as you know part of their culture more than likely were going to be ending up in New Mexico and Utah. So that's the second one that New Mexico and Utah would would determine, you know. Slavery based on popular sovereignty. So that gives the South the possibility of creating two new slave states. In, in addition, in, in effect, for giving up, you know, sort of um, California. In another element that's designed to appease anti-slavery forces, anti-slavery politicians and voters, the slave trade, the buying and selling of slaves in Washington D.C. in the capital of the United States is now banned. Okay, many. Anti-slavery and abolitionist politicians were extremely disgusted by the fact that here you had the United States, which was this sort of bastion of liberty founded on the idea of you know sort of everybody's created equal and all this sort of stuff, just a block away from the capital, you have human beings being bought and sold. You have human beings being kept in cages. And so the third sort of, and and so those people had for years been wanting to ban uh, the slave trade. And so the third element, the third bill. That Douglas pushes through. So each bill has its own sort of coalition that votes for it. So again, in effect, neither side has to give up anything. You just go vote for the stuff you care about. And then the other votes, well, you vote against it and you lose. Okay, big deal. So the third element is that the slave trade is banned in Washington, D.C. The fourth element is probably the most controversial of the entire uh, compromise of 1850, as this came to be known. But again, it's really not much of a compromise at all. And that is that the South, for years, Southern politicians and, and pro-slavery uh, you know, um, activists had been pushing for a stricter fugitive slave law. Okay, no, and and what I mean by this, a fugitive slave is somebody who runs away from slavery, you know, underground railroad, or you know, runs away to freedom, or whatever. And according to to the laws that were on the books at the time, if someone, say, you live in Pennsylvania, and somebody from Virginia comes to your town in Pennsylvania and says, hey, this man who is a free black man living in your town, he was my slave and he ran away from me and ran to Pennsylvania where slavery is outlawed. If someone comes and does that, what would happen then is that there would be a trial in the state of Pennsylvania, okay, where the person lives, and it would be a trial by jury, and the jury would decide whether or not this person actually was a runaway slave. And if they decide they are a runaway slave, then they are sent back into slavery. In this case, in the hypothetical I brought up in Virginia. We well, can guess what the problem with this is, right? You go to a place where most everybody is against slavery, and many people are actually abolitionists. And so the jury that you're going to be facing is a jury made up almost entirely of people who are against slavery. And so oftentimes, even when presented with irrefutable evidence that this person was a runaway slave, they would still find that this person was not a runaway slave and that they were indeed a free man. And so many slave owners felt like they could not get justice, what they felt was justice, um, in northern courts uh, trying to get their runaway slaves back. And so they wanted to change the laws that governed this situation. And so... As part of the Compromise of 1850, one of the, the, the bills that uh, 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 Stephen Douglas pushes through is a stricter fugitive slave law, which says this. First off, it says, if you know, if say you live in the North in a free state, 
and you know that, or even suspect that someone is a former slave and is a runaway slave, you are required by law to report them. Okay. Whereas in the past, there was no requirement that if you, you know, had knowledge of somebody who was a runaway slave, that you were required to report them. This strict refusal of slave, slave law actually can you can be thrown in jail for not reporting that somebody is a runaway slave if you live in a free state. Secondly, if someone is accused of being a runaway slave, they will their status will now not be determined by a trial by jury. But we will be determined, determined by a special commissioner who is appointed by Congress. In addition, these special commissioners will be paid in such a way that if they find that someone is a free person, not a runaway slave, but a free black, they will be paid something like $5. If they determine that the person is indeed a runaway slave, they will be paid $10. And so there's this sort of built-in sort of bias towards, you know, if you want to make some money, towards finding that somebody is a runaway slave, even if maybe they aren't. And so instead of what a compromise, you know, sort of ought to do, which is one, each side have to give up something to get something they want, what it also does is it just upsets each side that much more, right? Northerners aren't sensed by that fugitive slave law. I mean, that just upsets them to no doubt. I mean, they, they see it as unconstitutional. They see it as just the, the, the Congress sort of giving in to slaveholders. Uh, they're extremely upset by it. And, and then you also have, uh, you know, Southerners who are, you know, upset at the idea that they, you know, don't get to extend slavery possibly to California, even though the southern half of California is below the, the Missouri Compromise line, uh, and it's in line with other, you know, southern settlement. And also they're upset by the fact that they, that they, the slave trade is banned in Washington, D.C., because there's a pretty thriving slave trade that goes on in Washington, D.C. A lot of slaves are bought and sold there. And so what really the Compromise of 1850 does is to, while it, it deals with the issue of getting California to the Union. It it just sows you know that much more animosity uh, between both sides. Okay, and then with the Compromise of eighteen fifty um, over and behind him, and it's and it's certainly a victory for for Douglas. It it sort of makes him a household name, makes him famous. He's not done though. He still has even you know more ambitions, both personal uh, and political, or economic and political. Um, and that is, you know, Stephen Douglas, uh, just a few years later, wants to build a railroad. He wants to be the person who gets the, the transcontinental railroad, you know, bill pushed through. It's been an idea. It's been around for a while, but, but it hasn't gotten through Congress yet. And so Douglas, who obviously is from Illinois, is sort of based out of Chicago, uh, a Chicago politician, he very much wants the railroad, the transcontinental railroad, to come through Chicago, Illinois. Of course, one of the sticking points, and a lot of northern congressmen want the want the transcontinental road to go through Chicago, Illinois. But one of the one of the sticking points, I mean, there are a lot. First off, there are lots of reasons he wants to do this. One, just because he's from the north, and it'd be great for his district. It would, you know, or his state. It would certainly enrich his state having the railroad go through there. And and obviously, as we know, it eventually did, and and it's sort of what made Chicago. But the other thing is, is that personally, Stephen Douglas and many of his cronies have bought up all of the land that the railroad would go through in Illinois, and so therefore. For the railroad is going to have to turn around and buy it from them, and they're going to jack up the price and you know get rich off of it. So there's also you know he and many of his and his cronies are looking to sort of and and pretty much every senator and representative in a in a state where the railroad might possibly go through was sort of doing the same thing. So it's not like this was just something um, that was pertinent to, to Chicago and to Douglas and his cronies. But anyway, um, he stands to to make a lot of money personally from the railroad going through Chicago. The thing is. Many Southern members of Congress want the railroad to go through St. Louis, Missouri, uh, which is, of course, you know, much you know closer to them. Um, it would be a, a benefit, an economic benefit to those states and them as well. And so that's always been the sticking point: why the the, the railroad bill has sort of gotten you know bogged down in Congress is this fight over where it's going to go through, where its terminal, you know, sort of eastern end will be. And and so what happens is Douglas strikes a deal with many Southern members of Congress, and basically they say, listen, if you want us to go along with your plan to, to put the railroad 
through Chicago, Illinois, to route it through Chicago, Illinois, then you therefore then need to give us something. So you scratch your back, you know, I'll, I'll, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And 